YouTube, everything will go on at the same time. Okay, do you see it on? Let me check. I do. You do. Hey, everybody, on uh, on the Twitterverse and YouTubeverse and LinkedInverse, whatever verse you're in. Uh, give us a second. Looks like this is working. We're doing another live impromptu market chat with my uh, friend, Mr. Meb Faber, who a lot of people are big fans of uh, and knows a little bit about the uh, investment industry. I did a Twitter space with Meb probably over a year ago, uh, and now I'm trying to do these more visual kind of impromptu conversations. So I figured what we could do, Meb, is uh, – just kind of riff on where things are this year. Um, you put out a phenomenal tweet. I'll share it in a second as you're chatting. But uh, and, and more importantly, more importantly, guy, Ed, you uh, only you could get me out of bed this early in California. My mom is visiting. I want the the listeners to take note. Check out my Murphy bed in the background. This bookcase actually transforms into a bed. How cool is that? That's like, uh, isn't it like Mad Men style type uh, type shit? That was the kind of era back then. Um, I know. Well, it's it's comfy too, man. Um, so this isn't just a rate your room podcast background. This is real deal, holy yeah. field. Yeah, real, <laughs> exactly. All right, so I'm going to share my screen because I want to go through this uh, this tweet that you put out, which I think is phenomenal, and I think it, it provides a lot of really interesting context around sort of the uh, the weirdness, for lack of a better way of saying it, that happened uh, in the last 10 plus years for active managers and alternatives, which is this tweet you put out about uh, Sharp Ratio. Okay, so uh, first of all, just for those that are watching that are not familiar with the uh, these kind of metrics, explain what a Sharp Ratio is and why this chart to you is so uh, interesting. Sure. Sharp Ratio, we're diving right in. <clears throat> I'm only it, man. two got, sips we... of coffee in. You know, Sharp Ratio it. is um, a metric that can be used and abused by investors everywhere. Um, but at its core, I think it's actually pretty helpful. Um, we actually got to see uh, Professor Sharp here locally in LA um, give a talk and he's um, as bright as ever. But he, um, he developed a statistic that's basically tries to give you an idea for risk adjusted returns um, to try to compare asset classes or strategies uh, it's basically the return of an asset minus risk-free rate divided by the volatility. And what this allows you to do, um, the benchmark is <clears throat> most asset classes over time are around a sharp ratio of 0.2 to maybe 0.4. And um, they kind of wax and wane. And in everything, I mean, it's, it's gold, stocks, foreign stocks, bonds, real estate, commodities, I don't know. And um, same thing for strategies. And investing um, styles, you'll often see particularly younger ones or ones being marketed. They'll be like, this has a sharp ratio of two, you know, which which often you're like, oh, my gosh, that's amazing. But in reality, it, it, it often should raise more red flags than not. Anyway, if you put together a portfolio of assets, Bridgewater talks a lot about this. Some of their early work. Um, called um, engineering targeted returns and risks. We tried to co-op that phrase in our early days. Um, they show that you put together a portfolio and you end up with a higher sharp ratio. I mean, this is basically, you know, portfolio theory 101 goes back 70 years. People won Nobels for this in the early days. It goes to show that you end up with a portfolio of a sharp ratio of around, I don't know, 0.6 maybe. So higher than the individual components because they're not correlated. What we did on this chart is I was thinking the other day about this just romping, stomping U.S. bull market that has just mowed everything down in the past 15 years and been trying to have a conversation with people. You've probably seen this on Twitter. We talk a lot about foreign stocks and other things, anything other than U.S. market cap weight stocks, which are having a great year this year, um, and just how they've done over over time. And... I was actually surprised that it came out this clear, but I looked at a 10-year rolling return of U.S. stocks and then the, the Sharpe ratio. And it's actually a similar chart, by the way, but it shows there's, um, you know, if you were to tell people that, that S&P has a Sharpe ratio of one, you know, they say you're crazy. You know, obviously, I, I'm not going to believe that. I know that that's not true historically, but um, in lined up where here we are, where there's been four periods where it's kind of nicked above one. It was the roaring 20s, which seemed like an amazing time to be alive. The nifty 50s, um, which was an incredible stock period. 
my favorite bubble, which I lived through, the internet bubble, and then the recent one. Do we have a name for this guy, Ed, by the way, yet? Is there is there commonly accepted uh, COVID I'm, shitcoin era? I, 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 I mean, I, if, if I think about my CFA level four uh, uh, education, I think the, the yeah. era is the fucked era, I think is the way yeah. it's going. Yeah. Well, whatever this most recent one is. And the point is, like, look, you know, obviously things can get crazier. If you look at the nifty 50s, it went even more nuts. But um, but also, you know, erring on the side of this isn't necessarily normal. This is not. I mean, if you look at some of the best buying opportunities too, Jim O'Shaughnessy famously posted um, during the glo global financial crisis, a chart that was basically this. It may have been 20 year rolling returns. But it basically was like, this is one of the reasons why you should consider buying in 2009. Um, you know, but it's the opposite side of this, right? It was that, you know, returns had been terrible for a decade or two. So um, that was the basics of the chart. And uh, it would be fun. I should probably pull up some other ones, too, uh, if I get some time. But for U.S. stocks, it, it shows. And then this is only updated through year end. So you'll probably see that line scoot back up a little bit. So the reason I like I like emphasizing this, and let me just kind of end the screen. I know this is a little trippy, but the, the reason I like that chart is it really does put into context not only cycles, but also the reality that it's been really, really hard to have something that's active, tactical, that thrives on down capture, thrives on volatility when you're in this cycle of unrelenting, really, really smooth returns, which causes the risk adjusted sharp ratio to move higher the way it has. And comparing that to the nineties, comparing that to all those other periods, the question then becomes if these are long-term cycles and you're at this kind of elevated level to your point, yes, it can get more elevated like it did in the 50 fifties. But would that suggest that the next 10 years would be poor risk adjusted returns, which means most likely a lot more volatility and just poor performance in general. I mean, it's a it's a very technical phrase, but I think it's probably very accurate that says something along the line of the the good times follow the bad and, and vice versa, right? Like it's not it's not that crazy, but actually in general, these cycles play out over much longer periods and regimes than I think people are prepared for you know i mean and, and people are um you go to other countries and you travel the world and you talk about investments and people love to joke on twitter about now do japan here you got a great chart this is also from bridgewater talking a lot about bridgewater this morning i feel bad because i'm getting ready to write a post about how to uh how to clone bridgewater's uh, uh funds um but uh this is a great piece from one of dalio's books it has a chart in there that guy had um that you can click on and zoom in, but it's basically drawdowns. This is 60, 40, and this is real, but it goes to show pretty much everywhere you get uh, murdered in the 60, 40 per portfolio. And so as last year showed, it was, it was a pretty stinky year for 60, 40, one of the top five worst ever. Um, but it's funny when you think about sharp ratios and things like that. I mean, I think the, the best sharp ratio strategies you, you can come up with and you see these every few years get marketed everywhere. They raise a ton of money and then they implode or it is the option selling funds where they, they'll sell straddles, they'll sell strangles. Um, they have a sharp ratio of around two. They make like one or 2% a month consistently every month for a few years. And then they lose like 80%. You know, it, it's, um, I think there's some fun ideas there, but, um, but, but just going to show that these kind of cycles uh, which I know someone who talks a lot about cycles, uh, cycles can play out over longer periods than I think investors are, are willing to accept or willing to stick around for, which, you know, again, if you go to some of these other countries, um, this has played out a lot more recently. It's just only in the last 10, 15 years where you've had this unique period in the U.S. where the U.S. has stomped all uh, competitors. Yeah, and I've, I've talked about that before. It, it's, I'd argue it was really when the Fed did quantitative easing three, in late 2012, where you started seeing those big divergences, the FANG phenomenon became a thing. Small caps started underperforming 2014. Emerging markets, as you know, have largely, as I call it, been volatile cash. I wonder in, in those prior periods, in advance of these lead-ups to lost decades, uh, as these sharp ratios look really smooth, if there's any commonality around concentration risk, right? So you think about the nifty 50s, there's a reason why it's the nifty 50 there's a concentration in those large companies uh tail end of the uh, tech bubble same dynamic in 99 
Uh, and today, you know, I, I put out that tweet before. You look at the uh, the top ten holdings of the queues; they make up sixty percent of the fund, whereas ten years ago it was fifty percent. So we've gotten more and more idiosyncratic risk in supposedly diversified baskets. Is there is there something to the idea that that tends to be what typically happens in advance of I, prolonged periods of weakness? I think that's the weakness. I mean, it's it's I don't know if it's a weakness, but it's certainly a feature of market cap weighted indices. You know, if you go back to the nineteen twenties. Professor Schiller has a paper um, where he talks about CAPE ratio on sectors, but he's looking at valuations. And obviously the sectors were a little different 100 years ago, but, um, and, and I can't remember, but he was talking about utilities and railroads. Like, let's talk about the two most boring sectors today or industries. And one of them during that boom period got to a, a PE ratio of like 60, right? So people went nuts over the AI of a hundred years ago, right? It was railroads or utilities. I can't remember which one it is it's too early in the morning. But anyway, the point being is that what happens during these market cap weighting and everyone, you know, forgets this or doesn't put enough, I think, weight upon this is that market cap weighting is just price based. Like that's it. It's price of the stock times shares outstanding. There's no fundamental metrics. There's no nothing. Um, you know, you could have a market cap weighted indice where the top 10 positions have no earnings or sales or revenue. Um, people laugh at NVIDIA because it's trading at 30 times revenue, but you don't have to have revenue at all. It could be a totally, and so the prop market cap weighting in general works over time because you own the winners, right? The power laws, you're guaranteed to own the winners. It works out. It's like a giant angel investing portfolio and the losers is eventually go to zero. Your stop loss is zero. So you can only lose hundred percent, but you can make a 10, hundred bagger. Um, but it's giant weakness is that it has no tether to fundamentals. And so periods where some of these stocks go completely nuts, um, and Japan in the eighties, I mean, is really the, the prime example, but you just mentioned four in the U S and certainly in other countries, we've, we've experienced this in the past 20 years too. Um, I joke a lot about Columbia in the, the mid-teens with the, the bricks in the mid-2000s, I, I think got into the 50s of PE ratios. Um, the market cap weighting can expose you to booms and busts. And so because there's no tether to fundamentals and on the upside, uh, things can get totally loony, um, whereas some of these, the, the big names... And it's fun to read a lot of the market history books because you can probably see some in the background where they talk about you know, the names in the fifties and people going nuts over I don't know, Eastman Kodak or all these like, you know, hot stocks of the day and plastic companies, anything with, you know, camera and the word or, or um, microprocessor electronics. Um, and you're like, oh my God, this sounds just like, you know, today or just like the nineties. Um, and so that a lot of people, Rob or not has written some great research, calls it the fundamental index where he ties it to size, not necessarily, to market cap weight. Obviously, we love valuation, shareholder yield, value-based strategies. Um, and again, it's it's more of a feature. It's not necessarily like a bad thing, but people just need to be aware of it. And I think most are, are not. Most are, but not to the extent that they actually really think, you know, deeply about it. I think they kind of just, just accept that, hey, there was this amazing innovation in the 70s called the index. But in reality... Um, you know, I think the, it, it's, it, it puts us into periods like this. So I think that's actually a good transition to another uh, tweet I'm going to share here in a second, uh, which relates to where we are now. Uh, and that's the quote that you put out uh, on the Minsky uh, moment uh, and Hyman Minsky's uh, uh, quote on that, this idea that stability leads to instability, which is a very, you know, there's all kinds of variation of that Nassim Taleb's uh, approach, right? That uh, smoothness, low volatility tends to result in very high volatility, black swan type of setups. Um, you get a sense that we're maybe in a cycle now that is like that, um, given insane volatility with COVID. But then after that, everyone seemingly just forgot that risk exists. Yeah. You know, um, James Montier had uh, a fun... Of yours, yeah. yeah, he had a fun article um, a couple of years ago and... Um, in GMO somewhere where he looked at country stock markets and not, I think not just the U S but looked at valuations, for example, when they were in various quintiles, quartiles, fractiles, whatever it was. 
and basically looked at your future, I believe it was five year largest loss. And not surprisingly, he found that country stock markets, when they were super expensive, had a higher um, future largest loss, right? Like they were more fragile. They were really expensive and they had a chance to get, you know, worked, um, uh, to, put, to put it technically. Um, and so I think uh, that makes sense intuitively. You would expect that to be true, where if you're, and I imagine that would also be true with, with uh, individual stocks and sectors and industries. You know, I, I don't know that, um, you know, the modern age, I think there's one thing that's different. I, I think these type of markets have always been around. I do think the speed at which um, we're seeing a lot of this is unique. You know, the Silicon Valley Bank, um, 40 billion coming out overnight or 100 billion the next day queued up. Like, I don't think we've ever seen that before. The speed of uh, some of the online trading that started, you know, and then we watched like some of these short rippers, which have always happened, of course, but maybe the magnitude and speed at which this can happen with giant companies um, could be, I think, a, a surprise for people. I mean, obviously, we've seen things like the, the 1980s uh, crash where stocks went down 20%, right? Like that um, is still the big outlier for us in the US. But, um, but the magnitude and scale on some of these, I think, is, is um, surprising to people. What that leads to, who knows? Um, but it definitely feels like it's a lot easier for money to wash around uh, back and forth. I heard our, our um, friends at Ritholtz were talking and they're telling an old story about JP Morgan, which I'm sure a lot of people have listened to, but on the bank run in the 1920s where, uh, you know, he backstopped it and people came in and they said, um, you know, I want my money back. And he said, you can give everyone their money back, just count it out very slowly. Right. Like that's such a fun story. Today, you don't have that sort of wall. You just like people click, move my money somewhere else. And it's um, and it's easy. And I think the same thing uh, could happen with flows. So I, personally, I'm, a, you know, I, I'm, I'm rules based. So this doesn't make it in the portfolios. But I, I think when we look back with the fullness of history, we'll look to um, value investing, kind of having a regime shift in 2020 and then I think foreign may have had its moment Q4 of last year with the dollar, but uh, who the who the f knows? I don't know. We'll, we'll see uh, how those flow flow shifts uh, change. By the way, I'm glad you you uh, you do what I do, which is you always emphasize the rules based part of the strategies that you run. You know, you've got to be a spokesperson for your approach and for your way of thinking, which goes into the creation of fund strategies, but. Your opinion, my opinion, doesn't matter in terms of what we actually do in terms of the actual yeah. portfolio management. I think a lot of people get confused by that. They can't, they can't distinguish or differentiate between the person speaking about the product and and the person's ability to actually affect the decisions. Yeah. So as you can see, look, I'm wearing a Nuggets hat. I just got back from Game Five. Um, made it in time for kindergarten graduation the next morning. Um, but uh, that's a good example. Look, I mean, I cheer for the Nuggets, but. Um, doesn't mean over the past 40 years, I thought the Nuggets were going to make it to the NBA Finals, right? They were fairly terrible during most of that period. And, and a lot of the way I try to make this analogy is I say, look, this is uh, sometimes this is coffee or happy hour talk. Like this is this is more like kind of like the what I think and what I believe. Now, I love it when it does line up um, where things are agreeing with my models, where the value and momentum and trend is all lining up for an investment. And then I can say, yes, look, this is. Uh, this is what I think and it, and it makes sense. But, you know, I was telling someone the other day, they were like, I can't believe, you know, stocks are rallying or this is, a, and I was like, look, you know, go back and look at, you know, various market analogs in history. Even if you believe it's a, a you're in a big long pair market now. Um, and who knows? I was like, look at some of these rippers, these bear markets have where they go up 30, 50%. I mean, I think Japan's had some where they went up like a hundred percent. And I was like, even in 2000, I was like, this is a little summer, summer 2000 vibes to me. And my friends are asking me about Rivian again. <laughs> and I said, look, NASDAQ was up 30% that summer too, before going down 85, 89, whatever it eventually went down. So um, again, the, the, it's for color and to talk about it. Um, but, uh, but it often, yeah, it doesn't make it into what we're actually doing. Yeah. Although, and... Otherwise, I would never buy 
stocks like Abercrombie and Fitch and Dillard's in our strategies. Uh, I would look at them and say, oh my God, that makes me nauseous. And no one's buying corduroy pants anymore. <laughs> Speak for yourself. No, no. The, uh, <laughs> but actually, but, I'm, but you know, I've used that line many times. Bear markets make fools of bulls and bears. Because to your point, you do have these rippers and people suddenly start saying what we're seeing now. It's a new bull market. And I'm always blown away that people don't realize you don't know if you're in a bull market, except with hindsight. And in my view, until you've actually taken out the prior peak, you've got to take out the, the high water mark to really know. Otherwise, you're still in a drawdown, you're still in a drawdown. You can still say it's a bear market of sorts, right? Until you've overtaken it. Um, the thing is, to your point about speed, not only is our, our, is flow faster than ever, but narratives are faster than ever in forming, right? And I'd even argue AI makes that even, even more accentuated. You've done really well with Cambria. Uh, it's been a hard 10 years for anybody that's tried to do anything other than S&P, right? Just factually, but you've raised obviously quite a bit of assets. I got to assume you're pretty excited for the next 10 years, right? It's like, you can argue that the last decade has been somewhat like going through the desert. I mean, I've gone through it with my own approaches, right? Because in my world, you know, the risk on side isn't large caps. It's small or international. It sucked, right? For the most part on a relative basis. And in my world, any left tail risk, which is risk off, which you only really had in late 2018 and 2020. So you have more Minsky moments. Personally, I'm looking forward to that. More of a chance, right? To hopefully stand out, but uh, talk about sort of how you think about putting your business cap on the next decade for what you do. Yeah. You know, we just hit our 10 year anniversary on our oldest fund um, in May. So um, I know you've heard me say this many times, but for the listeners, you know, just, just being around, just surviving in markets is like the best compliment you can give someone, you know, if you generate alpha, if you're top quartile, if you're a uh, giant successful, God bless you. But, um, but just being around, I mean, the, the average public fund, you know, half of them go away over the course of a decade. And um, I always joke because everyone's always concerned about the little guys like us. And then I'm like, you know who closes all the funds? It's the big boys. It's They throw 400 funds against the wall to stick. Um, and, it's all survivorship uh, they, bias, man, with those large. I mean, that's just. That's yeah. Terrible. So um, I'm, we're just happy to still be around. Um, you know, I think the older I get, we were talking about this the other day. And I said, you know, I wish it's, it's hard to get the analytics on who owns your funds. Um, huge pain in the butt on ETFs versus hedge funds or uh, mutual funds or separate accounts. But I was trying to kind of publicly shame uh, all of us and our, and our friends in the public investing world, because I think all the investment advisors like to say, you know, they're, they're um, they'd like to look down on the retail investors and say, Hey, they're so irrational and crazy, but, um, we have a process and, you know, we're, we, uh, we're driven by process, not performance. And I look at it somehow a lot of them behave in our funds. And again, we have 12. So usually something's doing great and something's doing terrible at any given moment. We, we have a lot in foreign and value. So the past 10 years, like you mentioned, have been uh, rough. And so, um, but I watch them in institutions too. Cowpers, I poke my finger in Cowpers eye more than anyone. I mean, my God, they just announced they're going to 6X their venture portfolio in terms of size, despite the fact for the past 20 years, they've had essentially zero return on that portfolio. It was like 0.5% per year. Like you had to try to make 0% return on venture in the past 20 years. Like you could have just thrown darts and ended up somewhere better. Anyway, so just surviving, I think is, is a huge compliment. But I think if I had to go back, so to talk about the advisors, we did a thread where I was like, you know, 99% of people, including in, in institutions, um, they don't establish like what they're going to do a position after they buy it. They may do a ton of work. Hey, look, I'm going to buy this TV over here. I search Best Buy, read reviews, whatever, you know, but same thing with stock. They spend all this time and then they kind of wing it on the, what do they do when they have it? And I said, here's going to be an index card. We're going to start sending everyone say, thank you for buying our fund. Write down these four answers. Don't send it back to us. Just keep it, put it in a desk somewhere. First answer is like, why did I buy this fund? You know, I bought it because it's going to be a return enhancer. It's a diversifier. I think it's the best fund in uh, shareholder yields, the best fund in mid cap value, whatever. Boom. Two, how long do you plan on holding it? And so some people, they're tactical. They may be like, look, I'm using this as tradable. I'm using this as hedge. But other people are like, no, this is my core exposure. I'm going to hold this for 10 years. Um, three, would, and, and like, why would you hold it for less than that? Because there's a great, uh, the quote of the day, I don't do the quote of the day. My, my producer, Colby, who's amazing, does it. 
there was a great quote of the day where it was, I think it was Ken French, where he's like, if anyone tries to draw inference from an asset class for one, three, five, even 10 years, like they're crazy. Going back to the beginning of our discussion. So two, how long do you hold it? Three, um, do you plan on rebalancing? And if so, how? You know, hey, I'm going to rebalance back target yearly or hey, it's tolerance bands, whatever it is. And then lastly is when, when you plan on selling this fund, what is the criteria you're going to use? And I think that's the one that would, that would um, get a lot of people because, and I go, and I go, for me, my note card would be, and you're not allowed to say performance, right? Because um, people make, they make a lot of excuses for why to sell something if the performance is bad. Oh, this manager, I don't, the, the market has changed. Their style is no longer relevant or, hey, there's, there's something better I want to invest in, um, you know, uh, this other fund, whatever it may be. But 99% of the time, it's performance, right? It's underperforming. And um, my favorite quote that I tell people about this, I said, we've over 140,000 investors. The amount of time someone calls me and says, or emails me and says, Matt, buy your fund. It's doing poorly. It's doing worse than I expected. Could it do any worse? I'm selling it because it's doing worse than expected. Is that fine? Goodbye, little butterfly. Um, and then on the flip side, I said the amount of times someone's called me, and this has happened plenty of times. We have um, some funds that have truly done wonderful. And they say, Meb, your fund has done much better than I expected it to. We have to sell it. I'm sorry. Like it's just, it's done, it's performed too great. They don't say that. They say, my gosh, you're brilliant. I'm so glad I met you. I need to come down to Manhattan Beach. Uh, we're, and they double down the position, triple, quadruple, right? But if you looked at number four on that criteria, that would would never happen. So having that frame, a little bit of rant. You got me up early and coffee's finally hitting. No, dude, I, I'm um, with you on that. I'll take it a step further. It's like people, you can say the exact same pitch about your process when it, that strategy with that process is doing well and it's performing, people get the process. You do the exact same pitch to the exact same person six months later where they forgot everything that you said before and the strategy is not doing well, they don't understand the process, yeah. right? It, it is it, it is a maddening aspect of, of the business that is massively underappreciated by investors, by social media, FinTwit people. I mean, it's it's really challenging to kind of get, get that story out and get people to understand the story and then understand it and not change their understanding of it independent of the chart. It would be nice, and this really doesn't exist. Like, there's almost like a you, you do apps. If there was like a Tinder for funds app or strategies where you could go through it, but you're not allowed to look at the performance, right? Like, there's no chart. Like, you just see these funds. It's all the research. It's like a database. But in no scenario, you have to make a decision without looking at the past performance. And um, we do this with asset classes too. Like, we often say, "Hey, look." we blind these four asset classes. Here's the Pepsi taste test. Um, you know, which one do you prefer? Which one would you include both these? Yada, yada. We often do this with us stocks where we say, Hey, you can build a portfolio without us stocks and with us stocks. It's the same thing. Yada. Which one would you choose? We talk about with trend following a lot. Would you add this to your portfolio? Um, cause it removes your bias, but you know, no one exists in that world. They just end up putting it all in 80% U.S. stocks, 20% bonds and, and move on for the day, market cap weighted. But, um, you know, the career risk, um, if I had to look back 10 years ago and say, okay, Meb, fast forward 10 years advice. I'm like, look, career risk is not only a thing, like it is the thing. And talking to investors in, in the narrative around, um, you know, uh, how they behave and, way they go about it, I think is, is, um, a, a massive, massive impact. And you see it not just from individuals to financial advisors, all the way up to Cowpers and, and worse. I mean, remember they, they liquidated all their tail hedges like a month before the COVID <laughs> COVID struck. Institutional can be, can be, is basically in, in some cases, uh, uh, retail on steroids, I think in, yeah. in the way that they think about things. All right, listen, folks, we're, uh, or the half hour mark, uh, everybody that is uh, here, uh, if you're not following Meb, uh, please do so on Twitter, on YouTube. Uh, I'll try to occasionally do these on an impromptu basis. So make sure you click the notifications button for Meb and for me, select the live video since this is live and, uh, Meb, you know, I guess have some breakfast. It was fun, man. I, like I said earlier, I only get up and, uh, uh, to come chat with you this early. I'm going to go ahead for a surf. Listeners, come say hi in Manhattan Beach. We have a new office. Uh, we'll go for a walk on the beach.
talk markets, uh, go have a brew or go surf. Anyway, guy, come see us out here. Dude, you said Tinder and then long walks on the beach. I think that's a good <laughs> way to end the conversation. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, my brother. See ya.